In 1955, Ruth Ellis was the last woman to be hanged. Her execution played an important part in the eventual abolition of the death penalty. The road to the scaffold began on Easter Sunday, 1955. Colin Blakely, a keen amateur racing driver, went to the Magdala Arms in Hampstead, North London, for a drink with a friend. As they came out, a woman with a gun was waiting for him. It was his spurned lover, Ruth Ellis. She was consumed with jealousy and emptied six shots into Blakely as he tried to escape. As horrified customers poured out of the Magdala Arms, Ellis calmly gave herself up to an off-duty policeman. But how had she got the gun in the first place? Ruth Ellis had lived a complicated life as a club hostess. Colin Blakely was the love of her life, but their relationship was characterised by alcohol and drug abuse, intense jealousy, violent fights and passionate reunions. Waiting in the wings was Desmond Cusson, who looked after Ellis when she lost her job. He would listen for hours on end to her tales of Blakely's insufferable treatment of her. He gave her the gun and drove her to the Magdala Arms. Once convicted, Ruth Ellis did not lodge an appeal despite frantic pleadings of her defence team. On July the 13th, Ruth Ellis went calmly to her death. Her executioner was Albert Pierpoint, who was so moved by her dignity that he applauded the abolition of hanging in 1969. On July the 3rd, 1959, the South Kensington flat of American model Vern Schiffman was burgled. Over 2,000 pounds worth of furs and jewellery were taken, along with her passport. On the 12th of July, she was telephoned by a man calling himself Fisher, who tried to blackmail her, claiming he had some compromising photographs. Mrs. Schiffman agreed to pay $500 and to await further instructions. Fischer was Gunther Podola, a German who grew up in the wasteland of Berlin immediately after the war. There, among the ruins, he learned his trade as a petty criminal. He found his way to Canada, from where he was subsequently deported, before turning up in London. Meanwhile, Mrs. Schiffman contacted the police, and a phone tap was put in place. When Fischer called back, Mrs. Schiffman managed to prolong the call for engineers to trace the call to South Kensington Underground Station. At Chelsea Police Station, Detective Sergeant John Sanford was joined by his colleague Raymond Purdy, even though he was about to go off duty. They cornered Podola in the call box in the tube station and escorted him upstairs to their waiting car. But Podola broke free and ran across the Gloucester Road and into Onslow Square, where he took refuge in number 105. There he was cornered by Sanford and Purdy. While Sanford called for help, Purdy was momentarily distracted for long enough for Podola to pull out a gun. He fired, and Purdy fell, mortally wounded, shot through the heart at point-blank range. Padola escaped again and took refuge in a hotel around the corner, the Claremont House Hotel, Queensgate. Although Padola had left plenty of prints at the murder scene, it was only when Purdy's widow realised that a pocketbook returned in her husband's belongings was in fact his killer's. Through the names and addresses in the book, police finally identified Padola. He was arrested 72 hours later. During his arrest, a hefty detective sergeant, Albert Chambers, charged the door, hitting Podola in the face and sending him sprawling. Because of this incident, Podola claimed loss of memory during his defence. Medical opinion was divided, but he was declared fit enough to stand trial. The jury were not convinced by his explanation and found him guilty of murder. Podola was hanged at Wandsworth Prison on November the 5th, 1959, the last person to be hanged for killing a policeman. In 1961, the fight against crime was given a new weapon with the introduction of the identikit. Photo montages of suspects could be created quickly and flashed around the country. 
The first murderer to be caught by Identikit was Edwin Albert Bush. He robbed and killed shopkeeper Elsie Batten, for which he was hanged. In August 1961, the country was gripped by the A6 murder. A lone gunman abducted a pair of lovers. The married man, Michael Grigston, was shot and killed in a lay-by. His mistress, Valerie Storey, was sexually assaulted and, despite being shot, survived and was able to give a description. She was able to give a description of the man. She was able to tell me who she was. Uh, she was able to say that uh, a gunman had held him up uh, at Slough, uh, uh, rather, she'd picked him up at Slough and uh, they'd held him, uh, he'd held him up and uh, shot him. Although she had been shot seven times, she immediately gave police a description of the killer. It was vital to the police at the time, but remains a central issue in all the disputes around the case since. We are anxious to trace a man of the following description aged about 30 years, 5 feet 6, proportionate build, dark brown hair, palish face. Initial suspicion fell on Peter Louis Alphon, who stayed in the London Hotel, where cartridge cases from the murder weapon were found. Alphon gave himself up to the police, but Valerie Storey did not identify him. She identified an innocent stand-in in the identity parade lineup and Alphon was released. Then James Hanratty, a petty criminal, was implicated because he too had stayed in the hotel room where the cartridge cases were found. This time, Valerie Storey identified him as the killer. At his trial, despite an alibi and circumstantial evidence against him, Hanratty was convicted. Hanratty was asked if he had anything to say. After a false start and a long pause, he said, I am innocent, my lord, and I shall appeal. The black cat was draped on the judge's wig. James Henratty, the sentence of the court is that you suffer death in the manner authorized by law, and may God have mercy on your soul. At Bedford Jail, Henratty was one of the last men to be hanged in the country. He protested his innocence to the end, a claim a growing number of people had begun to believe. His father campaigned tirelessly for years until his death, but to no avail. Wheels of justice turned slowly. In 1967, Peter Alphon gave the case a bizarre new twist. He called a press conference in Paris. Mr. Alphon, are you or are you not the A6 killer? Well, I've uh, stated that I was at the press conference that I held, and I held it for that specific purpose. And when I say something, I stand by it. So you are the man who fired two shots at Michael Gregson and killed him, and who raped Valerie Storey and fired seven shots at her? And that's what I said at the press conference, and I'm going to stand by it. Now, there seem to be three different opinions of you. People think that you're either a liar, a killer, or that you're mentally disturbed and unbalanced. Which are you? Maybe it's all three. But Peter Alphon has since retracted his claim and pleaded victimization. He said he knows who did kill Michael Grigson. A random act, or was there something else? The hub of the whole matter is that the truth did not come out at hand at his trial. If the truth had come out then, there, would, there wouldn't be any, any, of this, uh, any of this controversy. Pe people sent, uh, the gunman was sent. I, I know the people that sent him, you see. I made it my business to, to get to know the woman. And the authorities know who they are, and they knew from the outset. Whatever the outcome of any reviews, they can't change the outcome for James Hanratty.
It was hailed as the greatest robbery of all time. In 1963, the Glasgow to London mail train was robbed. The diesel train was pulling 12 coaches made up of sorting wagons. The coach second from the engine was used for carrying high value items. And on the night of the robbery, there were 128 mailbags full of notes of various denominations. Just after the town of Leighton Buzzard, there was a dwarf signal known as the distant signal. It was showing amber, which meant the driver had to slow down. And the next signal on a gantry at Sears Crossing showed red. The driver dutifully stopped the train, sending his fireman off to a call box to find out how long the delay would be. At that moment, a gang led by Bruce Reynolds overpowered the team in the cab and uncoupled the first two carriages. The driver was then forced to drive the train to Bedigo Bridge, where the gang unloaded nearly all of the mailbags into a waiting truck. The haul was taken to Leatherslade Farm, the gang's hideout about 20 miles away. The gang left their fingerprints everywhere, and when they realized the heat was on, they panicked. Many were soon caught and given harsh sentences. Probably the most famous gang member is Ronnie Biggs, who managed to escape from jail and flee to Brazil. Some people consider him the brains behind the operation. Oh. Ronnie Biggs, the brain of the Great Train robbery? I don't think so. One of his first robberies, he broke into a house during a snowstorm. He wanted to get out of his wet clothes, changed, Unfortunately, he left behind his trousers with his name and address inside. A little later, he went on to rob Red Hill Railway Station. He hid in the toilets until the middle of the night. To keep himself company, he took in sandwiches and a newspaper. About three o'clock in the morning, he broke out and robbed a station of 17 pounds. Unfortunately, he left behind the newspaper with his address on it. Now, the brain behind the Great Train robbery was Bruce Reynolds. <laughs> Probably the most reviled killers in Britain are Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. For 15 days in 1965, the nation was shocked into disbelief as their story unfolded. Over the previous two years, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley had kidnapped children, sexually abused them and killed them before burying them in shallow graves on Saddleworth Moor, near Manchester. Brady and Hindley are still in jail more than 30 years later, symbols of evil. In 1987, new interest was awakened in the case when Hindley announced that two further murders had been committed and that both the bodies were also buried on the moors. Brady and Hindley both helped in the search. The body of Pauline Reed was found. Finally, a family could put their little girl to rest. The body of the other victim, 12-year-old Keith Bennett, has never been found. In recent years, the subject of release has come up. Hindley and her supporters claim that she's served her time and is no longer a danger to society. I don't know anybody now who thinks Myra, no sane person who thinks Myra ought to be kept in prison until she dies. I don't know anybody who'll say that to my face. But lots of the I public think that. What? Lots of the public think that. The so-called public, the man in the pub, what does he know about it? She looks for compassion. 
but ask any of the families of the victims. Would they want Hindley released? Would you? She should be in prison and left there to rot because she shouldn't be on this earth at all. She should be, she should be tortured like she tortured them kids. I'm sorry, but that's the way I feel about it. So who was the last person hanged for murder in Great Britain? Bizarrely, we don't know. Why? Because two men were hanged for the same murder on the same date at the same time. In the annals of crime, it was a very squalid murder. A 53-year-old van driver had been stabbed to death while being robbed. Two men were quickly apprehended and sentenced to death. Peter Allen was hanged in Walton Jail in Liverpool, Gwyn Owen in strange ways in Manchester. By an odd coincidence, the name of the chief executioner was Harry Allen, the same surname as one of the last victims. And that date, August 13th, was the same day that the first private execution took place in Britain, and this the last. A knuckle duster and a kosh. Very nasty. But it's much nastier than you think. It's actually a swagger, a cross between a sword and a dagger. These two weapons were actually carried by members of the firm. The firm was the name given to the gang led by Ronnie and Reggie Cray, the only identical twins ever to be tried for murder at the Old Bailey. In the 1960s, Ronnie and Reggie Cray became the most notorious gangland bosses in London's underworld. Their key to success was an appetite for violence that silenced rivals and bred loyalty through fear. However, that violence ultimately led to their downfall. In March 1995, Ronnie Cray died of a heart attack. He was 61 years old. It was the East End send-off Ronnie Cray wanted and had planned from his prison cell. From early morning, security men hired by the Cray family encircled the funeral parlour in Bethnal Green, where the funeral procession was due to begin. Among the floral tributes for the convicted gangster and killer was one from his twin brother Reggie and his celebrity friends. Reggie Cray appeared handcuffed to a prison officer, granted compassionate leave to attend his brother's funeral. The cortege took a route along the same streets that the Crays used to rule with their own special brand of terror. Thousands came out to watch the spectacle, although some were not impressed with the theatrical style. I think it's disgusting, really. Uh, he's obviously a local hero. There's a lot of people around here with suits in that I wouldn't have expected to see with suits on. I don't think it's right myself. Past Valence Road, where the twins grew up in a house long since demolished, it's unlikely he would have recognised this East End. At St Matthew's Church, Reggie Cray was greeted like a returning local hero. But they were not always so well liked. They weren't liked at the time. They were certainly respected and feared, but they weren't liked. There won't be too many tears shed about the demise of, of, of Ronnie Cray. I would say great funeral, shame about the life. Of course, the family defended Ronnie, citing his mental illness when he committed his The one crime. thing I would love people to remember, who, don't, who say bad things in life, remember he had an illness. And if it wasn't for that, he would have been a different person. As Reggie left the church, dozens of supporters chanted for his release. At the cemetery in Bethnal Green, Ronnie was laid to rest alongside his mother. Reggie was returned to Maidstone Prison, but in the year 2000, Reggie was granted his freedom. He is desperately ill with cancer. As the 1960s came to a close, the wife of an Australian newspaper executive was kidnapped from her London home. The police were faced with a crime unknown in Britain for hundreds of years, 
kidnap for ransom. Despite her husband offering to cooperate, the body of Muriel Mackay was never found, although two brothers, Arthur and Nizam Hussein, were charged with her abduction and murder and found guilty. It was the scandal of the 70s, a peer of the realm on the run for murder. Police believe he tried to kill his wife, Veronica, but that he mistakenly bludgeoned his children's nanny, Sandra Rivet, instead. The murder took place inside the family's home in Belgravia, and Lucan disappeared almost immediately afterwards. There was a massive police hunt, but he has never been found. Did he go abroad? There have been countless sightings. Or did he commit suicide? Or was he, too, murdered? and fed to the tigers in the late John Aspinall's wildlife park at Port Lynn in Kent. All these are theories that have been put forward. The assumption that he was still alive continued until recent times, with an artist's impression showing how he might have aged. But today, without a death certificate being granted, he remains the missing Lord Lucan. Every crime has a motive or at least the criminal believes so. It can be love or hate, for money, or maybe just for fun. But in the case of Peter Sutcliffe, he wanted to rid the streets of prostitutes. The man who became known as the Yorkshire Ripper took his mission even further. He picked on any woman who was walking the streets at night alone. Following time-wasting hoax letters, the police received a tape recording purporting to come from the killer. The voice drove the police in yet another direction, towards a man with a certain accent. All these diversions put the police off the scent. But on the 2nd of January, 1981, a routine police patrol noticed a suspicious-looking car and took the driver in for questioning. This time, they had their man. Sutcliffe was charged with murdering 13 women. The body of his final victim, Jacqueline Hill, having only been found two months before the arrest. Less than five months later, Sutcliffe was found guilty and sentenced to a minimum of 30 years. An evil man put away. A Metropolitan Police uniform. Nothing particularly special about it, except it was worn by Britain's first homosexual serial killer. The ex-policeman's name... Dennis Nielsen. In 1983, the residents of 23 Cranley Gardens, London, complained to their landlord of blocked drains. They had no idea that within days the tabloid press would refer to the inconspicuous semi-detached as the House of Horrors. On Thursday, February the 8th, a plumber arrived to inspect the problem drains. He was sufficiently concerned that he informed his boss that the porridge-like mess causing the blockage might be human flesh. Upstairs in the attic flat, Dennis Nielsen knew that his past was about to catch up with him. When he was arrested the following week, he was asked if there was just one or two bodies. Nielsen replied that there were 15 or 16 since 1978. The search for his victims took the police forensic teams to Nielsen's previous address at Melrose Avenue in Cricklewood, where he had burnt his victims on large bonfires. We found a number of uh, interesting items, uh, which uh, can only be uh, established once uh, Pathologists as a general. Are you satisfied that they are in fact human bodies? Uh, this is a possibility, yes. But they are um, Could human you, uh... bones, yeah. We have found uh, considerable uh, items of bone uh, this morning and this afternoon, and we will continue with the search tomorrow. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not scientific minded, but I would think that probably uh, one uh, piece is from a hip and a small part of a rib. It appears as though the bodies have been burnt in the back garden before uh, burial. 
uh, is a possibility. Nielsen was a civil servant at the job centre in Kentish Town, but he was desperately lonely and would trawl the haunts of runaways and the young homeless looking for victims. He would then bring them back first to Melrose Avenue and then later to Cranley Gardens, where he would strangle them. Their bodies were dismembered and hidden under floorboards, in cupboards or under the sink, wherever he could fit them. He enjoyed their company and would bring his newly murdered corpses out and talk to them or watch television with them. I fell asleep and I woke up and he was strangling me and um, I passed out um, after sort of thinking, I, I actually I thought that I'd got caught up in the sleeping bag which he had warned me about and I thought he was helping me out but he wasn't and anyway I passed out from that and I remember vaguely hearing water running and being carried and I felt very cold and I realised I was in the bath and he was trying to drown me. I think Nielsen was a man who stalked victims by night in a patch he knew very well, areas that he'd been to as a policeman, as a night guard. He loved the sordid, seamy life. He used to observe it. He's a voyeur of the uh, underworld, if you like. And I think over the years, he um, grew so much a part of it that he wanted something more. His office life, I think, was very boring. He was a very strong union man, but he wanted an excitement which he never found in the civil service. When he was caught, he freely confessed his guilt, but was shockingly vague about the exact identity of those he had killed, leaving police with the suspicion that there may have been more. I just can't go over it. How has it affected the family? It's affected everyone in them. Would you have any kind of warning to the parents of youngsters, particularly here in Scotland, who were thinking in terms of going down to London? Never to go. It's such a cruel, horrible place. Although women have been in the front line of police work since 1916, it was only in 1984 that the first WPC was killed. Yvonne Fletcher was gunned down by an unidentified sniper during a siege at the Libyan embassy. America is a gun community. Britain is not. And when a similar tragedy occurs in this country, it shocks even more. That is just what happened in a small market town one day in August 1987. The peace of Hungerford was shattered by a hail of bullets which left 16 people dead. Michael Ryan was obsessed by guns, but had no previous history of trouble with the law. But following the death of his father in 1985, he began to suffer from depression. On the 20th of August, all that changed. Why? We will never know for Ryan shot himself before giving anyone an answer. Well, we were working around the side of the calf, right? Mm. Well, we heard a, <laughs> we thought there was a car backfire, you know, living in New Zealand, the shot, like. Right? Mm. We see a, we sort of look to the roadway then, like, mm, we see a motorbike sort of going slowly past, and he more or less come to a stop right, isn't it? Mm. And he's looking back towards the garage, and then after a second or so, he just sort of took off slowly, like the bike did, and next thing we see was a, well, we thought it looked like a grey Astra, you know, sort of silver grey Astra, sort of leave this garage forecourt, I suppose, must have been quite fast, like, and just head up the road to Hunkford. Fire brigade were called to a house fire in um, 
north view, just a straightforward house fire. And when they got there, a the guy suddenly appeared with a high-powered rifle and started shooting at them. And they obviously withdrew. Um, there were also children playing in nearby gardens, and uh, they sort of rushed, screaming hysterically into their homes as other people dive for cover, because this guy then was just sort of blasting away anything that moved. He then started firing at the home of this woman. Now, whether there's a link with, with him and her, or whether that was just coincidence, we don't know. He just looked like he was out walking. You know, it just looked like everybody else, like he was just walking down the street, firing a gun. And then you got everyone off the streets and sort of... Well, I just told all the kids to get out of it, and, and a few of the neighbours, I just told them what was going on, and to go in and lock their doors, and, and that was it. I came away very sharp. Calls for tighter gun controls reached a deafening crescendo when the ordered life of a large primary school in the small Scottish town of Dunblane came to an abrupt halt at around 9.15 on the morning of Wednesday the 13th of March 1996. Police received a message that there was a gunman at large having entered the school from the back of the site. Fifteen children died. Thomas Hamilton, a 43-year-old local man, walked into the school carrying four handguns. He went into Mrs. Gwen Mayer's classroom and started shooting. Within minutes, 15 children and Mrs. Mayer were dead. He then turned a gun on himself. As the news spread, parents rushed to the scene. Tears of relief flowed as many were reunited with their loved ones. For others, the tears were of despair. I found out that at that stage I knew it was primary one, and then I found out that it wasn't my daughter's class, and I, I, felt, I felt relieved, and then I felt terribly guilty that I felt relieved. As we live not too far from the school, uh, she'd actually heard some shots this morning, um, which is quite unusual, uh, very loud noises, and she suspected that um, there was something amiss. And she came down immediately, uh, but by that time, the, I think the police or the authorities had acted very quickly and the uh, school was cordoned off. I believe there were very loud bangs. Uh, normally any shooting in, uh, in the area is, uh, is purely pheasant shooting um, or legitimate use of shotguns through um, uh, the uh, farming community. Oh, she was a brilliant teacher, you know, full of life and cheerful and, mm -hmm. you know, can't believe that she's gone. We had her the first year that she came to the school. Yeah. And she was first class. She was really <laughs> friendly. Yeah. And she was she's just, easy to talk to and, you know. She made sure that you got on well with her sort of thing. Yeah. She made sure that um, you know, you enjoyed yeah, being she'd sort class. all problems out for you and she's just a brilliant teacher, I never forget her. Why did she do it? Why did he want to harm innocent children? The answer lies in Hamilton himself. He had run a boys club which had been shut down. He partly blamed the teachers at Dunblane who had been instrumental in the closure. He had been kicked out of the scout organisation after inappropriate behaviour and he had been barred from joining two gun clubs due to his spreading reputation. But this doubtful character still owned a firearm certificate. He still managed to join a gun club in another area. And on that March morning, he took out his anger on the children at the primary school. What happened after Hungerford didn't stop what has happened today. And I think uh, what we should uh, concentrate on is what a disastrous act this has been uh, and the impact on the community. And I think we all have to show support for the people who have suffered uh, these losses.
The tragedy began a train of events that culminated in a nationwide gun ban. Thousands were handed in to police stations. But only time will tell if it cuts down on gun crime. Meanwhile, the pain of Dunblane is clear to see. The town is trying to get back some sense of normality. But the cruel murder of 15 innocent children will never be forgotten. January the 22nd, 1988, Leicester. Colin Pitchfork became the first person to be convicted of murder using DNA evidence. He murdered Linda Mann, aged 15, on November the 21st, 1983, and Dawn Ashworth, also 15, on July the 31st, 1986, before being caught. At that time, DNA, or genetic fingerprinting, had been developed by Alec Jeffries less than 10 miles from the murder scene. Also, on the third anniversary of the man murder, suspect Richard Buckland became the first person to be cleared of a crime by DNA evidence. One of the people who was interviewed during the ensuing house-to-house -house inquiries was a 25-year-old baker, Colin Pitchfork. He had previous convictions as an investorate flasher. In January 1987, police decided to DNA test every male in the district between the ages of 17 and 34. This became known as the blooding. One of those scheduled for testing was Colin Pitchfork. He worked as a baker in Leicester. At the end of January, he persuaded one of his colleagues at the bakery to undertake the test for him. He explained to 24-year-old Ian Kelly that because of his history of flashing, he was afraid that the police would try and frame him for the murders. When Kelly failed to be convinced by this argument, Pitchfork explained that he couldn't take the test because he had already taken it in place of someone else. On the evening of the 27th of January, Ian Kelly gave blood and saliva samples to police using Pitchfork's identity. By the 1st of August, many thousands of samples had been sent to the Huntingdon Laboratory for processing. Police had travelled to most parts of the country to trace men who had moved from the area or who were working away from home. At lunchtime that day, Ian Kelly took his lunch break in the Clarendon Public House in Leicester. Three other co-workers accompanied him. One of the party was a 26-year-old bakery manageress. Over a pint, Kelly told the woman that he had taken the blood test in place of Colin Pitchfork. The knowledge that the tests had been rigged bothered her and she eventually rang a policeman friend and told him of Kelly's revelation. Kelly was arrested on the morning of Saturday the 19th of September and charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Pitchfork was picked up for questioning from his home in Littlethorpe that afternoon. He quickly confessed to the double murder. On the 22nd of January 1988, Colin Pitchfork pleaded guilty to the murders of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, two charges of rape, and one of conspiracy. He received two life sentences for the killings, 10 years for each of the rapes, and three years on the conspiracy charge. In 1991, Albert Dryden committed the first murder live on British television when he shot a local planning officer who had come to oversee the demolition of Dryden's illegally built bungalow. When Robert Maxwell bought Ivy Needham's company, he literally went on the record promising her a prosperous future. We are a reliable operation to be trusted of considerable size and substance. And Widowed and almost blind, Ivy and thousands of others found that Maxwell distinct. repaid their trust by stealing their pensions. Angry, I feel very angry, very bitter. I mean, nobody has a future. We, we all get up every, every, every morning and just wonder what's in the post today. Although the Mirror Group ploughed £100 million back into the fund, only around a third of the victims were Mirror employees. Clearly, the directors of the company have the company's interests at heart. Uh, if they are also trustees of the company pension fund, 
then there must be a conflict of interest. And we believe that that shouldn't be allowed to occur, that there should be safeguards which prevent those sort of scenarios taking place. So it's really a question of where we go next now. And I think in particular what I'd like to see is the fact that if a company goes into receivership and therefore their pension scheme has to be wound up, that the cost of that winding up doesn't fall on the poor pensioners who've already had the blow of losing their jobs. The cost should either be met by some central government fund or be a charge on the receivership of the company. Your pension is as safe as the trustees of your scheme are honest. This, the whole structure, the whole house of cards, pre-Maxwell, relied on the integrity of the trustees of these schemes. Maxwell cheated his accusers when he fell from his yacht into the sea and drowned. Did he fall? Was he pushed? Or did he jump? I want you to share in that future with me. Just six hours after arriving in court in 1992, Tony Tier heard a judge sentence him to death, the only permissible punishment for murder in the Isle of Man. Although the sentence would be commuted to life imprisonment, the chilling words of the death sentence made Tier gasp. You will be taken from this place, said the judge, to the Isle of Man jail, and thence to a place of execution, where you shall be hanged by the neck until you're dead. Tia had killed Corrine Bentley, a cold, calculated murder of a defenseless young woman. Tia had lured her to a remote country spot and cut her throat with a Stanley knife. He claimed he was offered 600 pounds to do it to settle a family property dispute. It was an historic moment, because although the mainland had abolished the death penalty, the Isle of Man is a crown dependency with its own judiciary. Although the British government rarely interferes with Manx law, this was one occasion when the central government intervened. The Queen was asked by the Home Secretary to use her prerogative of mercy, and the sentence was duly commuted to life imprisonment. This was the deadliest attack in the history of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. The sheer loss of life, men, women and children, has been deeply horrifying for the people of a small province who have endured much, but never on this scale. Seven hours after the explosion, the authorities were still not sure exactly how many people were dead and how many lay injured in various hospitals across Northern Ireland. What they do know is that a car bomb exploded in a main street of a busy market town. All that was left of the car was its blackened, twisted remains. When the bomb exploded, families were in town to shop and to enjoy a festive parade. People getting on with their lives. A hoax bomb scare further up the road resulted in the police unwittingly urging the people towards the real bomb. The blast sent debris and glass scything through the packed pavements and shops. Inevitably, Friends, families, neighbours and those whom fate had placed elsewhere when the blast happened rushed to the scene. They were confronted with a scene of utter devastation and carnage. Bodies of women and children, hands lying up. In the middle of the road. People are asking me for help and there was one lady, her arms were just hanging off and I mean, that was... There's nothing I could do, you know, you just felt helpless, you know, saying to them, the ambulance is coming now. Although the ambulances arrived quickly, the helpers also commandeered cars, buses and vans to ferry the injured to the local hospital. It was soon inundated. Those who were beyond medical help were taken to a makeshift morgue. Anyone who goes up that street and just sees the carnage that's left there, sees the baby's shoes, the pampers, the spectacles on the ground, the blood there, must say that Northern Ireland must have a better future. There is no cause served by this except the cause of the people that carry out, just bloodlust.
Although Omer was a mixed town of both Protestant and Catholic communities, with little or no history of conflict, the blast brought the two communities together, their shared experience, Northern Ireland's greatest tragedy. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that Fred West had been in this actual building. In fact, he'd spent a night in the cells here. He'd been accused of abducting a young girl, but unfortunately, he was let off scot-free. West was a builder, and these are some of his tools. They were actually found in the basement of 25 Cromwell Street. When police arrived at 25 Cromwell Street, home of Fred and Rosemary West, to investigate rumors of pornography and child abuse. Little did they know what they would find. The Wests were exposed as Britain's worst serial sex killers. Sex, that was his favorite subject. I mean, we've all seen soft porn and some have seen hard porn, but this is like the real, real, the grotty stuff. In 1973, police were deployed to look for three teenagers who had gone missing from the Gloucester area. No trace was ever found. The girls had fallen into the clutches of the Wests, who would go cruising, looking for victims. She said, um when he's got a woman companion with him, it makes it easier for the victim if they go and pick up a girl. Because Rose is with them, she doesn't hesitate to say no because there's a woman and a, and a bloke in a van. Over the next six years, the Wests tortured and killed five more girls in the cellar of their home. Fred West using his expertise as a builder to conceal the bodies. He showed me these pictures and, and, and some uh, abortion equipment. He said that if I knew any girls who, who wanted an abortion, you know, he'd give me a, a few quid if I brought an eight to him, like, you know. Their eventual arrest followed the persistence of a Gloucester detective, Hazel Savage, who had been nagged by persistent rumours that there was a body buried under the patio. On February the 25th, a specialist search team arrived at 25 Cromwell Street with a warrant to begin searching for Heather West. They had no idea what was to follow. Officers who found Heather's remains within hours also found evidence that she was not alone. Fred West was brought back to the house and questioned. He led detectives down to the cellar, indicating where the other victims were hidden, even suggesting the depth to which the detective should dig. Over 11 days, 25 Cromwell Street was ripped apart, and eight further sets of remains were unearthed from below the cellar and the ground floor bathroom. No one will ever know how they died or what suffering they endured. As forensic scientists work to identify the victims, Fred West tried to claim that he alone was responsible for the deaths. During more than a hundred hours of taped interviews, he adamantly denied that Rosemary West knew anything about the murders. wicked woman and I am absolutely delighted the tears of frustration because we missed it but the tears are also of joy that she's going inside and she should never ever ever come out I believe he uh, took a lot of secrets to his grave not only uh, in uh, our case but uh, 
in perhaps other families as well. The experience of serial killers shows that almost without exception they go on killing until they are caught. And I think if I were a policeman in this case, I would certainly be looking for both the bodies. Justice may have been done, but his suicide left painful and unanswered questions, questions that only Rosemary West would be able to answer. But as the 20th century came to a close, a new serial killer was exposed as not only Britain's most prolific murderer, but quite possibly the worst the world has ever seen. Dr. Harold Shipman was a doctor at Hyde, Manchester, who thought he could play God by ending the lives of his elderly patients with lethal doses of morphine. To date, he is believed to have killed as many as 150 people, but as some were cremated, we shall never know for sure. That ends our journey through the landmarks of crime. We've tried to show you some of the first, the last, and the superlatives. As we go into the second millennium, no matter what happens to the methods of crime for the police or the criminal, there's one thing I can guarantee you, that the stories will continue to be fascinating. <laughs>